Good morning. Good morning. I hope you're doing well today. As for me rejoicing, because this week marked my first year anniversary as pastor of grace. What a blessed man I am. At this time, I'd like to call our brothers and sisters who went into the baptismal waters just a couple of months ago, and let us begin with Isaac Clark. Isaac, come forward. Father, again, we give you thanks because 
Your word inspires us. Your word encourages us. Your word points us in the right direction. We can never go wrong when everything that we believe in and everything that we practiced is founded on your word. Bless us, O oh God, we pray in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen, Lord, and amen. We started talking about Elijah as the scripture praying prophet. We discovered in the word that when Elijah prayed, he prayed based on the word of God. And since he prayed based on the word of God, God gave him what he prayed for. And not just that he prayed the word of God, but he prayed the word of God rightly divided. I cannot stress that enough. Again, many people in the church, throughout all the denominations, like to cherry pick certain verses out of the Bible and pray on them, but many times, do not receive their answer to prayer because those verses were not rightly divided. You cannot add your own spin to the Word of God. You cannot come up with your own interpretation of the Word of God. The Word of God interprets itself. And whenever you put your own spin on it, whenever you provide your own interpretation and you pray erroneously, those prayers will never, never, never be answered. So Elijah was a scripture praying prophet. And because he was, God shut the heavens. Then we learned that Elijah was the combative praying prophet. Now, Elijah was combative not because that was his nature to be combative, or not because Elijah simply just liked to pick fights. Elijah was combative because he was defending God's name and God's cause. And any true preacher, any true man of God, any true woman of God, any true Christian will always be combative when the name of God and the word of God and the cause of God is being trashed, especially in the church. If you recall last week, Elijah was combating with his own fellow Jews. He was contending for the faith. He was trying to bring them back from the erroneous path which they were on, which was only leading them to destruction. Today, we have people who engage in apologetics who, instead of contending for the faith, apologize. Apologetics is not about apologizing. Apologetics is about duking it out with people in the spirit in order to ensure that the word of God always triumphs. It's the same thing with polemics. In polemics, you cannot pull your punches. Anytime heresy, false doctrine, doctrines of demons, or doctrines of men rears its ugly head, you have to contend. If not, the church will find itself in error. And once it, once it finds itself in error, then God withdraws his presence. And that's where we get the word Ichabod, the glory is departed. And if the glory is departed, if God's departed, we might as well put a padlock on the door because it is an exercise in futility. Today I want to talk to you about the revival praying prophet. And I'm going to continue this theme all of next month until the last week in which we begin our season of Advent. The revival praying prophet. What is revival? Well, for the purpose of today, 
Revival is a spiritual refreshing. Write that down. Revival is a spiritual refreshing that God through His grace grants His people. It is a what? A spiritual refreshing. So, let's look at the introduction. In the introduction, it brings us back to this theological syncretism where Ahab, the king of Israel, had allowed through the marriage with his wife Jezebel for her to import Baalic priests, the priests of Baal. These were, these men, these false teachers, 400 of them and 450 of the Starte. You had the male deity Baal and his, the female deity Astarte. And those 850 priests had polluted the land with their insidious teaching. One of the practices of Baal and Astarte was, or one of the things that they encouraged in their insidious doctrine was for God's people to worship in high places. A high place is a mountaintop that is mowed down, it's cut down, it's all the brush, all the trees are removed. And it's called a high place because there, Baal and his wife encourage people to engage in sexual orgies. It is like a pornographic movie for the gods. And this is why it had to be high up, and this is why all the brush had to be cleared, and hundreds of people were invited in there to just engage in filth. Now, that was done in order to excite Baal and Astarte, and if you got them excited, then the theology was that they too would copulate, and when they copulated, their cosmic and divine seed would come upon the vegetation and would come upon the livestock and thus you would have multiplication. So as you can see, it's very easy to build a church if you're promoting fills because that just caters to people's sin nature. So it's very popular. This is why you have to have the priest of Baal and you have to have the priest of Astarte to bring this doctrine and show the people how they could receive blessings from the God if they would what? Come down to a level of ultimate filth. This is what the prophet Elijah was combating. And so the more you engaged in this nasty behavior, the more you gave yourself to this, the theology was the more the gods would bless your lifestyle. So if you had a you that was always giving you birth to one little slam, if you went to the high place and did what you had to do, then Baal and Astarte would bless you with three yous. And so you can just see your wealth just multiplying because back then the driving engine of Israel's economy was agriculture. The more agricultural surplus you produce, the wealthier you got. And it was that today's version of what we call today the prosperity gospel. The prosperity gospel that has no basis in the word of God. It is a doctrine of demons. So, Elijah was fighting this. And by the way, if you think that this is just an Old Testament concept, just look it up in the New Testament, the citations that I give you here, where Jesus says, notice what Jesus says in Revelation 2.6 and in 2.15. Jesus says in Revelation 2.6, I hate the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Now, he doesn't say he hates the Nicolaitans. He says he hates their doctrine. And then he goes on to say, I also hate their deeds because doctrines lead you to live a certain kind of life. So Jesus said, I hate them both. I want to save the Nicolaitans, but I hate their doctrines and I hate their deeds. This is what the prophet Elijah was fighting. The Nicolaitans are a New Testament version of what Jezebel had imported into Israel. 
So now, let's go to Roman numeral number one. Elijah, the revival praying prophet. Revival came after three years and six months of praying, which produced the decimation of Israel's sole economic engine, which was what? Agriculture. That's all Israel did. All Israel was engaged in. It, they were not like the other nations who were engaged in other types of enterprises and manufacturing. Israel was solely engaged in animal husbandry and harvesting crops. So when God said no rain for three and a half years, as he had promised that he would if his people rebelled, that decimated their economy and that brought them literally to their knees. Revival also came after the key doctrinal matter was settled. Who is the real God? Is it Baal or is it Jehovah? And last week we saw in his combative nature, Elijah prayed that God would send down fire from heaven. And when God answered by fire, the people said, we're no longer in doubt. Jehovah is God. And then finally, revival came after the false teachers and their flesh gratifying, soul polluting, soul damning doctrines were eradicated from among God's people. Once you eradicate the false teachers, their doctrines go with them. And once the doctrines go with them, you have cleaned the church of doctrines of demons. So now, how did the revival come? Did it come through preaching? Did it come through teaching? Did it come through an orchestra? Praise and worship. Did it come through plays? Did the church put on a series of plays to draw people back to God? Did the, did the, did the church have, you know, fellowships where, you know, they had pizza parties and they invited everyone in the neighborhood to come? What did the church do to secure a revival? Well, Elijah prayed. Because that's how you secure anything from God. Listen, if a church needs a pastor, you know how a church gets a pastor? By praying. That, because he's the source. He's the one who has all the pastors in his hand. If you want one, if you want him to give you one, you got to pray to him. Now, you may go about trying to get one on your own, but then you're going to be stuck with a lemon because you didn't what? Pray. Elijah prayed. Notice what it says in verse 42 of 1 Kings 18. So Ahab went up to eat and drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Mount Carmel. He too went to a high place. He too went to the highest place that you can go. If, if the prophets of Baal and the prophets of Astarte are going to promote junk on the high place, I will promote holiness on the high place. So Elijah went up to the high place and he cast himself to the ground. Notice, he went up to the high place, but he wasn't high and mighty. No, he humbled himself. He cast himself down to the ground. He knew his place before God. He cast himself to the ground and put his head between his knees and he began to what? He began to pray. He began to do what? Pray. James says, and he, Elijah, prayed again, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. He prayed. Now, he starts to pray, and then he says to his adjutant, to his assistant, he says, now while I'm praying, you go run, to the edge of the cliff, you go on to the edge of the mountain and look out into the sea where the sun heats up the sea and causes the vapors to come out and pour them into clouds. You run out there and you tell
tell me if you see anything. And the runner went and came back and says, I don't see a thing. He says, go back seven times. Do this seven times. And so the guy runs out, sees nothing, comes back, reports, runs back out again, sees nothing, comes back. Now notice, 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 notice. The effectual, fervent prayer. The, the, the man, the woman of God that never gives up praying. That prayer avails much. He stuck to it. Elijah kept praying. And on the seventh time, his servant came back and says, listen, there's a cloud. We haven't seen a cloud in years. There hasn't been a cloud in years. We see a cloud the size of a man's hand. And you know whose hand that is? That's the hand of the Lord. The hand of the Lord is about to open up the windows of heaven. And so Elijah says to his servant, you go run and tell Ahab, he better make a snappy. Get down to his palace. Get down to where his, his servants are. And he better get there before his chariot gets stuck in the mud. For there is the sound of an abundance of rain. Grace Church has been praying since January. The first Tuesday in January, we started to pray it this year. And we have been praying ever since. Unrelentlessly, we've just been praying. On an average, week to week, sometimes it's 30, sometimes it's 22. But if you average out week to week, we have 25 strong that are calling in every Tuesday to pray. I started coming here the first Monday in April. So the first Monday in April would be my first time going out, you see nothing. Then I came in May. We went out, saw no indications of any showers of refreshing. The third month, June, nothing. The fourth month, July, nothing. The fifth month, August, nothing. The sixth month, September, nothing. But lo and behold, in October, We saw the first indications that revival was coming. If you remember on Sunday, October 2nd, because I record everything, I write everything down. I'm always watching, I'm always discerning the signs of the time. On Sunday, October 2nd, there was a young man sitting back there named Cody. And he was a mess. I mean, this is a big, giant, I mean, this is a strong guy. This is, this is a man's man. And the Lord had him back there crying like a baby. That's God. That's the Spirit of the Lord. Then on Tuesday, the five, just a few days later, we get a call. A young man by the name of John Bush calls. I run down here, and he's waiting for me there, and he comes in. And I don't, I'm not saying anything to this young man. I'm not, I just opened the church door and he's bawling. And he's crying out to God. You see, my brothers and sisters, that is the Lord. The Lord is drawing them. And then I, with those two, as the little hand of far off, I'm telling you that there is the sound of an abundance of rain. So I say to you, get ready. In 2023, there is a sound. It has not been for naught that we have been interceding day and night, praying. God is at work. God is on the move. And I just want to encourage you to be in expectation. As I close, on September 25th, we were supposed to anoint the cornerstone. That was September 25th. On that day, Pastor Harry was down with COVID. Pastor Harry and Sister Debbie were down with COVID. Now, I had promised Pastor Harry that in that ceremony, he and I would do it together. So it was scheduled for the 25th, and when he told me he had COVID and he was in bed, he couldn't get out, I said, not a problem, we'll just postpone it until you get here. But on that day, if you recall, on that day, it was raining. Now, I already had this sermon lined up for that day. I had everything laid out for that day. And it didn't happen as I had planned it, but God gave me a token. Rain. 
on that Sunday. And it was pouring. So even if Pastor Harry had come that day, we weren't going to be able to do it anyway because God, remember, remember saints, that when Solomon started to dedicate the temple, God gave him two nonverbal indications of his approval. The first was that the fire came down from heaven, and the second was his temple, the, his glory filled the temple. Those were the two nonverbals. Well, on that day, I got a nonverbal. And the nonverbal for me was rain, the abundance of rain. Dear God and Heavenly Father, we give you thanks. We give you thanks because this is your church. And we're doing things your way. And we're turning to your word. And our interest is your kingdom. Thus, Lord, bless our efforts, we pray. As we endeavor, as we endeavor to go out into the highways and the byways and snatch men and women from the clutches of Satan, transferring them from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of your dear Son. Bless us, O oh God, we pray. Send us forth with Holy Ghost power that we, like the apostles and the early church, may go out winning souls to Christ. Fill this house, not just once, not just twice, not just three times. I believe, Lord, that you can fill it four times. And even when I say you're filling it four times, I'm still cutting it short. Because you are the mighty God. And Satan has been put on notice. Bless this church, O oh Lord, and not just this church, but we've been praying for every church in this town, for every pastor, for every deacon board of every church, every trustee board of every church, and we're praying, Lord, that the revival would not be just selfishly for us, but for all your people. There's enough souls in St. Johnsville to fill your church over and over and over again. So we pray, Lord, for a spiritual revival for every church in this village. This we ask. This we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.